that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own, into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps and Peepers. I'm Dan. My my voice sounds like my voice again. Yeah, you sound so nice. Hi, Dan. Hello, Lindsay. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm on antibiotics. Fine. I had, had had to go back to the doctor mm-hmm. for the cold that won't die. It's a, some kind of some kind of demon flu I have. Well, three weeks now. But, uh, yeah, it has been three weeks actually. Yeah, it's been three weeks, but I, but I'm, I'm holding myself up in the house. I just came into the studio just to record, and I'm gonna leave again. Good. And just keep taking meds and uh, meds and and ho- homeopathic all stuff. All the potions. I've been giving you so many potions. You don't even know. I've been hiding things in your smoothie. Great. Uh, <laughs> Lindsay, Lindsay has mushroom, insisted on taking care of me. Huh? Yeah, mushroom compounds. Okay. Chakra powders. Chakra powder. <laughs> it's, it's not a thing. I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> uh, love hearing all the don't be a Darren talk. And uh, and now I know uh, when I was in St. Louis, some people had some don't be a Peggy stuff. So yes. I want to clarify. Okay, Lin- let's hear it. Lindsay and I were talking about this last night. Uh, there can be two. There can right. be don't be a Darren, don't be a Peggy, male, female. Same type of person. Because I didn't want the ladies left out. Maybe right. our ladies don't right. care to be a Darren. Right. So so a Darren is just a dude who could easily avoid future uh, paranormal harassment by mm-hmm. avoiding certain actions and behaviors, but chooses not to. What an idiot. And a Peggy is the same thing. Peggy is somebody who just continues to make their paranormal situation worse and worse by just being an idiot. Yeah. Peggy's a dumb shit. <laughs> so don't be a Darren. Don't be a Peggy. Don't be a fucking idiot. And and it was great to see all the, uh, the, the creeps and peepers out in St. Louis when I was doing stand-up shows. Man, it was a crazy weekend. I know Lindsay couldn't make it. I know, so sad. You know, you just, you can't be everywhere. It, it was the it was the first weekend where there was a, a decent amount of couples who were not Time Suck listeners, not really stand-up fans pr- pr- prior to coming to the show. Yeah. And, you know, were mainly scared to death fans. That's really cool to see. It makes us uh, very excited uh, about, you know, continuing to do the show, hopefully for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. And I'll be, I won't be in Salt Lake City either. Mm-hmm. Sorry. It just doesn't always work out that way but i will be in nashville yeah and huntsville and hawaii well actually no i'll be there but i won't be at the show yeah i think i'll be at some shows in in texas maybe uh, i think so i'll I be think around so. we'll figuring it I'll out be around and and met a fair amount of people in st louis who either knew the lachance people from the union scream oh, house yeah dang it great info there people who were like oh yeah nope they still believe uh to this day that you know all that happened yeah um and, and then also the um lemp uh yes. mansion the the curse of the lamp family met several people who worked there oh cool who came to the show that's who, really cool uh, met people who had went on tours who had seen creepy things yeah met people who had been to the lachance uh you know uh the the union house who mm-hmm. had, who claimed to have seen creepy things in that house dang so it's very cool to like you know meet people who had been to the places we've talked about in prior scared of that stories did it make it feel more valid Absolutely. more real made it Be- feel more real because there's th- there's this person who you can see and i always say this right like, you don't look like a crazy person you don't right. have like you know frazz you don't look like you know what's uh the lady who drove the bus and the magical school bus this oh, frazzle or whatever uh, yeah you don't yeah. look like her right you don't look crazy and all disheveled like you're a human <laughs> right. being who has enough uh, finances to get yourself to a stand-up show to carry on a conversation sure. that for me it's that element that's like oh yeah you're not just like some made-up Darren or Peggy in my head sure you are John standing in front of me yeah. telling me oh yeah I've seen it yeah yeah, yeah. very very uh, cool very yeah. cool to uh, have that connection I'm holding on to a special stone this week what's your special stone well this is a rose quartz but I'm holding on to it it has um, a depression in the middle so it's like Ah, oh, yeah, very soothing. soothing. But but mostly I'm holding it because my friend Sarah, uh, Sarah mm-hmm. Hunt, uh-huh. the the wife of podcaster James Petrogallo over at uh, Small Town Murder, mm-hmm. her and I are besties, and she had sh- uh, shoulder surgery yesterday. She did. So I've been thinking about her, and this is she sent this to me. Well, that's very nice. To my friend. It's very nice. It was a funny video she sent the other night. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> she she sent this video because she had a nerve blocker. Her whole side of her face looks like she had a, a stroke. Droopy. A little droopy. <laughs> oh, Sarah. 
Uh, th- <laughs> thank you, Sarah. And thank you for the continued ratings and reviews, for subscribing and watching uh, uh, on the Bad Magic Productions YouTube channel. Um, we'll have our own website very soon if it's not up already. Yeah, yeah. Logan's hard mm-hmm. at work on that. So thanks for your patience. Just like all these things take yeah. time. So we appreciate everyone just being cool about it. So, yeah, we're moving forward. Uh, but for right now, you know, on socials, it's just uh, Scared to Death Podcast, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, thanks for continuing to find new creeps and peepers to bring into the fold. And uh, new awesome merch really quick before I talk about the previews in the store. Voodoo Dolly tote bag. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's so good. I love it. It's very cool. And also a Voodoo Dolly long sleeve shirt and a couple different color options. Oh, it's so good. I'm ordering this one today. I'm yeah, stoked. Logan is uh, doing awesome stuff over there at Spicy Club. And then how many stores do you have today? How many I have two. Okay, you have two. How many do you have? I have two as always. Uh, my first of two tales is the Jabotacable Poltergeist. Chibata bread. <laughs> One of Brazil's most infamous examples of a spirit or spirits terrorizing a family, focusing most of the, uh, the po- paranormal energy on an 11-year-old girl. Oh, no. I don't like when they focus on the kid. Mm, it's down in Brazil. It's a rough one. Okay, so it's a good sandwich. Got it. Second story is an uh, overview of what might be America's most famous haunted house, the very strange Winchester Mystery House. Never heard of it. San Jose, California. Okay, well, never going to San Jose. <laughs> Uh, so if you're ready, I can get into a little setup and we can go into the first story. Yeah, I was so cold when I came into the studio because the studio was 62 degrees today when I came in here. So I had to yeah. get my STD blanket mm-hmm. on. I do have my socks on. Just another fan submission. I don't even oh, remember yeah. where these came from. Thanks for all the socks, you guys. Yeah, thanks for the gifts in St. Louis. I know, you guys are so generous. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I am clearly healthy and I am ready. Okay, perfect. I'm amped up. Let's do it. For this first story to be true... You have to be open to the possibility, however remote, of three things being true. Malevolent spirits, past lives, and actual witches. Actual witches? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. In the story, a girl is supposedly tormented by the malevolent spirits because in a past life, she was a witch, uh, according to these spirits. Oh, okay. Okay. So let's head to Jabotacabal, uh, Brazil, small city of about se- around 76,000 in the Brazilian state of Sao Paulo, uh, down in the south central part of the South American country. Jabotacabal is a picturesque city located in a lush tropical climate full of blue, uh, like a blue collar population where most of the jobs revolve around peanut farming or sugarcane plantations. Mm-hmm. Home to uh, one of Sao Paulo's uh, st- state universities, satellite campuses. Has a bustling little downtown full of both modern buildings and classical architecture. Large canal bisecting the town, giving residents a pretty place to walk and reflect. One of the wealthier towns in Brazil, considered a good place to live. Full of beautiful, lush green landscapes, a giant decorative Catholic churches. Most of Jabotacabal, like most of Brazil and most of South America in general, is very Catholic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And has been so for a long time. Of course. Uh, Jabotacabal uh, was very Catholic back in 1965 when one young Catholic girl may have been ruthlessly terrorized by angry spirits in one of Brazil's most infamous hauntings. So time now for the tale of the Jabotacabal poltergeist. In 1965, Jabotacabal was a simple agricultural village where the Ferrero family made their home. They were a respectable Catholic family, not wealthy, but comfortable. Their youngest daughter, 11-year-old Maria Jose, was a quiet and sensitive girl adored by her family and neighbors. She was also despised by entities who suddenly made their presence known. Something, or some things, hated young Maria Jose Ferrara. In December of 1965, small pieces of brick started falling out of the Ferrara ceiling. That's weird. Not totally unusual. They lived in a very old home, but the amount seemed strange. A lot of pieces began to fall, and making things much stranger, they only seemed to fall on or near their daughter, Maria Jose. Oh my God, if our house just only started to crumble around Monroe. Oh my God. So I'd have to kick her out. Over the next few weeks, over 300 little pieces of brick fell on or almost on Maria. That's weird. Once an entire eight pound brick came loose and fell near Maria, who moved just before the brick smashed into the ground and broke into two. Jeez. It could have badly injured her. Oh my God, yeah. And then when Maria's mother went to pick up the two pieces, they seemed to magically snap back together as if they were magnetically attracted to one another. It was all so odd. No one can explain it. The family had their home inspected. It was structurally sound. The bricks shouldn't be crumbling and falling. And if the house was truly falling apart, the bricks would be falling around more than only Maria. A family friend contacted a local dentist by the name of Yohei uh, Volpe. A um, dentist? A, a, a dentist who is also a spiritualist fascinated with the paranormal world. Okay. He has a very Brazilian name that I had the pronunciation guide coming up later. I thought I had it there. 
Very it, Portuguese. There is YouTube videos dedicated to people butchering this specific name. Hilarious. Like jokes about it. Uh, after hearing all the family stories, he felt that the Ferrara family must be dealing with a poltergeist. Poltergeist, we've talked about them often here on Scared to Death. Mm -hmm. uh, Juo. That was his name. Juo. Juo? Juo Volpe. How do you spell that? J-O-A-O. -O. Juo. Juo. Uh, the word poltergeist comes from German words that combine to mean noisy ghost. Oh. And poltergeist activity has been documented for nearly as long as people have been writing. Accounts of ghosts rapping on walls and knocking over furniture seem to date from at least as far back as the first century CE. Tales of demons and monsters and unexplainable things go back to the very beginnings of humanity. That's very unfortunate. Maybe, depending on what you believe, they go back even further than the beginnings of humanity. Well. People started calling loud, angry spirits poltergeists in 1838. Before that, the restless spirits of the undead were called by many other names. And poltergeists have been reported as behaving in many different ways. They've been witnessed as being playful, mischievous, irritating, elusive, aggressive, menacing, violent, and occasionally even murderous. And strangely, poltergeists seem to show up a, disport a disproportionate amount of the time around the young, often appearing around girls and boys on the cusp of beginning to become young men and women. So exactly Monroe's age. Mm-hmm. Some think that poltergeists are attracted to the curious and innocent nature of this age. Pieces of brick continued to rain down from the Ferrara home ceiling, generally pelting Maria until Juo Volpe talked with the curious and innocent Maria and her family about the presence of the poltergeist in their home, and then he attempted to communicate with the spirits and ask them to leave the poor family alone. And then it appeared that things did calm down for a while. Okay. The poltergeist stopped for the moment trying to hurt Maria. And then the spirits returned, and at first they seemed peaceful. And a strange period of peaceful coexistence ensued. Maria found that she could ask the unseen presence for a sweet or for a flower or some other small item, and occasionally these items would appear at her feet. That's so weird. Did they want to play nice? Uh-uh. One day, while Maria was out walking with Volpe and a friend, she told her companions that she would like a little brooch. And then magically, a few feet away, a glittering brooch caught Maria's eye. The poltergeist still had a fondness for stones, but it seemed more playful now. Sometimes a rock would come from nowhere and tap someone lightly on their head and then fall to the floor. On some occasions, the rock would t tap three separate people on their heads before falling to the floor. The people hit said it felt more like being touched by a ball of compressed air rather than being hit with a stone. Fascinated by what was happening in the Ferrara home, Volpe asked Maria Jose's parents if she could stay with him and his wife and kid for a while while he studied her. Oh, dear. And since by now Volpe had become a good friend of the family and they trusted him, they agreed. He sounds kind of creepy. The first few days that Maria Jose spent in the Volpe house were peaceful and free from the phenomena that had plagued her parents' home. Volpe began to wonder if the spirits were tied to the Ferrara home somehow and not Maria. But then rocks soon began to strike the Volpe home. Whatever this was, it was connected to Maria. Everyone, including Maria, would be inside and they would hear what sounded like rocks hitting the walls of their home. They'd also hear loud bangs that appeared to originate from inside the house. Loud bangs that seemed to come from nowhere, but also from everywhere. Now Maria's family turned to the church for help with their, whatever was harassing their daughter. Being Catholic, they turned to a local priest who came to the house and ended up performing both a cleansing ritual on the Ferrara home and an exorcism on Maria that seemed to both go incredibly smoothly. Great. Awesome. No protests from any entities of any kind during the rituals. Satisfied that he'd done his job, the priest left the Ferrara home seemingly in peace. But the spirits weren't peaceful. They were now furious. They'd hidden from the holy man and now escalated their attacks. The poltergeist began throwing plates, vases, and glasses. Shards of glass now constantly littered the house. The poltergeist broke tables, moved furniture, and tore pictures from the walls in the middle of the night. The poltergeist began to attack little Maria Jose again. Oh, no. She was slapped by unseen hands across her face hard enough to leave bruises. My God. She had chairs thrown at her, a sofa, and even parts of a radiator. When she tried to go to sleep at night, it seemed as if something was literally trying to kill her. Something forced cups over her mouth and nostrils. Something was trying to suffocate her. What the hell? She heard it whispering in a language she didn't understand. She didn't know what it said, but it was certain. But she was certain it wanted her dead. And then there were the needles. Something was sticking sewing needles inside of her. What? She started waking up to find little needles buried deep into the heels of her feet. Ooh. How could this be happening? Oh, How did the pain not wake her? 
Once her family claimed that 55 separate needles had all been placed in her feet over the course of a single evening. Shut the fuck up. Maria Jose was understandably terrified. Her mental state was beginning to appear fragile. She desperately hoped the torture would end. She just wanted to be a normal 11-year-old girl again. School at least provided a respite from the torment. But it was getting hard to stay on top of her studies. One evening when she was working on her homework in her home, Maria's clothes began to smolder. And then they quickly caught on fire. What? Volpe the spiritualist happened to be at the Ferrara home. He'd come back to try and help when the poltergeist activity had escalated after the priest attempted cleansing the home and failed. And he saw this happen. He was standing next to Maria when her clothes caught fire and he tried to put them out and was burned in the process. Yikes. Somehow Maria herself was not badly burned in this incident. Volpe decided that the Ferraras needed the help of someone more powerful and more knowledgeable about spirits than he was. So we drove Maria Jose three hours to visit Chico Xavier at the Spiritualist Center in Uberaba, Brazil. Chico was becoming, or had become a legendary spiritualist who was a prolific automatic writer. What does Auto- that mean? Uh, automatic writing, or psychography, is a claimed psychic ability allowing a person to produce written words without consciously writing. People, claim this, uh, people claiming to possess this ability say they are merely a physical conduit to some supernatural force. Something is writing through them. That's crazy, Doc. Over the course of 60 years, Chica would write over 490 books and several thousand letters via this process. All right. And to try and persuade others into thinking he was not a con man and making it up, he refused to be paid for any of these writings. The proceeds of all of these books, some of which were very popular, he sold a total estimated 50 million copies, all went to charity. All right, well, maybe he's not terrible. And Chico claimed to have made contact with the spirits that were attached to Maria. He said that the spirits had figured out who Maria really was. He told her family that the spirits were convinced their daughter had killed many people in her past life. She'd been a witch, an especially evil one, and the spirits tormenting her with the spirits of those she'd killed. After hours of pleading with these spirits to leave Maria Jose alone, Chico declared that the spirits had indeed agreed to leave. Okay. They understood that Maria was not the same person that had killed them many years before. And Maria Jose returned home to live with her parents. And then her tormentors returned. Uh. The spirits had tricked Chico as well, and they continued to taunt and harass Maria. And her mental state quickly deteriorated. She felt hopeless. There was no one else to turn to now for help. She worried these spirits would never leave her alone. She was harassed and terrified for several more years. And then, when Maria Jose was 15, in a desperate attempt to finally escape the wrath of these spirits, she killed herself. (gasps) Her mother found her dead in the kitchen. She drank pesticides mixed with soda. No! After her death, the paranormal activity at the Ferrara home came to an abrupt and sudden end. The spirits had gotten their revenge, and now all was quiet. Oh my god! That was a horrible ending. Yeah, yeah, crazy. I didn't crazy. care for that at all. I, I mean, when you started to say like it came to a, you know, an ending, or in an attempt to, I was like, no, no. Yeah. No. Ciabatta bread? <laughs> what are you talking about? She lived in Chibata Bread. Did you drink caffeine this morning? Nope. Nope? <laughs> I'm not allowed to have caffeine. Good. You seem a little hopped up. I'm not allowed to have caffeine. Why are you hopped up this morning? <laughs> I am just happy. Okay. Right. Can I just be happy? You can be happy. Yeah. <laughs> you just seem a little perkier than normal. Hmm. Maybe maybe it's the mushrooms I put in our coffee. Oh, man. Do you know that there's mushrooms in your coffee? I did not know Actually, that. Actually, it's in your smoothie. My smoothie. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so a couple pictures. I mean, yeah, it's so sad. Yeah, yeah obviously, so uh, sad. Obviously, Jen. yeah. And uh, so this this first this first picture. This is uh, Maria Jose. J.K. Uh, there are no pictures of her I could find online. So. That is a really fucking creepy photo. Mm-hmm. At that first came it up didn't when I was me, looking for it. But then, like uh, the it's the eyes, the white not, eyes. Yeah, and just the way she's really staring at me. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> Uh, this is Chico Xavier. Okay. This is he really is a a, a pretty uh, famous. I mean, he's, he's passed away. He, he, okay. But uh, for many, many years, he wrote a lot of books, supposedly under this process of automatic writing, which obviously skeptics are going to say is complete and total nonsense. It feels like complete and utter bullshit. But skeptics would say everything we talk about on this show is complete and utter bullshit. Right. So right. it's that and, whole thing. And the fact that he gave away all the money, that that kind of gives me a little bit more like, okay. But then did that just make him more famous? I know. I know. There's that, that argument. Yeah. So. Yeah. So an interesting dude, uh, one way or another. I like his sunnies. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of the Jabotikable poltergeist. Um, 
Uh, JK. I couldn't find any pictures of that I was either. like, what? There's I don't a, even know what I'm looking at. This is actually a picture that this, um, I, I'm glad it's sometimes. weird we, dolls. I know they are weird dolls. The one in the black that's like got the hands uh-huh. and the weird nose and the eyebrow. I don't like the little clown with the orange face in the corner. Of course you don't. Now, I, I like sometimes when I'm just doing uh, Google image searches for pictures that relate to one of these stories because often they will lead me to another story. Did this lead you to something? Yeah, this led to a story of the South Shields poltergeist, um, which... I haven't looked into much yet, but just looking into it briefly, I'm like, okay, there's another good future story. Okay, okay. So sometimes that poking really around. freak me out. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah, random yeah. spirits haunting a house. Well, yeah, because I they don't really show themselves. Sometimes they do. So, the, 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 poltergeist is just a term. It's not like a type of spirit. It's just a term for spirits haunting a house. Like like the Enfield right. poltergeist, you right. know, the Jabotikable poltergeist. It, it, it just it, it, it can refer to like one spirit or many spirits, but whenever there's a bunch of paranormal energy uh, linked to a home, right, you can call it poltergeist activity. And and I understand that, but like it's different. For some reason, it freaks me out because it's like it doesn't materialize like a hat man or mm. a shadow person. Okay, I want to bring up some poltergeist activity. Okay. Okay. Uh, you were getting, you were going to bed the night before you were headed to St. Louis. Uh huh. And we were lying in bed. It uh-huh. wasn't that and you, late. And you kept popping up and annoying me. Well, let me tell the whole story. Yeah. Okay. 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 So you weren't feeling well. F- right. Fair. Okay. We'd gotten into bed and like our headboards here and there are bedside tables on either side. My phone was, if this is my table, <laughs> my phone was here completely yeah. on. We're in bed, we're snuggling, and the next thing you know, my phone falls on the floor. And Mm. there's no explicable reason that happened. But wasn't Gigi down on the floor? No, that's what I was trying to tell you that night. You weren't fucking listening to me. The bedside table's here. Gigi was on the other side, nowhere near the cord, that my, my charger cord. She was like under the window in that weird little spot that she likes. She was completely away from it. Mm. So my phone just randomly fucking falls on the floor. Was it plugged in? Yes. So someone was pulling the cord? I don't know. It just doesn't make any sense. Because it's a really long cord, too. It's not like the short cord where it kind of like is a little bit taut when it's on top of the bedside table. So it's not like it just could be like kind of twisted on something. It's like a six or 12 foot cord. I mean, it's ridiculous. It goes from the bedside table, underneath the bedside table, underneath the bed to the uh, power strip. Right. So made absolutely zero fucking sense that it would fall on the floor. So it falls on the floor because Penny's in bed with us. Ginger's nowhere near it. Yeah. Dan is like near sleep. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh. Mm-hmm. oh my God, why did that just happen? And that, it was fucking on. I was freaked out, couldn't get comfortable. And then Dan was like clearly over it. Mm-hmm. You rolled over on your side, faced away from me. And then I snuggled up right behind you and I pulled the blankets up really far. But then I kept like feeling something. So I kept, popping up uh-huh. and eventually you were like what uh-huh. why are you popping up and you mm-hmm. yelled at me and i was super spooked. freaked out mm-hmm. i just i just think uh <laughs> it's weird that your side of the bed is covered in crystals and that's where the phone moved and my side of the bed i don't got shit you and, do you just don't know it and nothing happened there's crystals on your side of the bed underneath the bed you're ridiculous i've hidden them from you <laughs> sometimes in the night when i get up to go to the bathroom i just put a little crystal on your head no, you don't. No, I don't. <laughs> it would be great if I did. I thought about it. But I will say that like while you were gone, uh-huh. uh, I saged the house. I salted and smudged all the doorways. The house feels extremely better because the reason that I even did that was A, the phone activity, mm-hmm. and B, like one night I was in bed and I heard a very weird noise come from Monroe's room. And I was so freaked out. I'm like, I'm not fucking going up there. And I, while you were gone, I slept with the closet lights on. Our our bedroom yeah. closet lights are very bright and I just turned it on, opened the door like a tiny crack because I can't, when we remodeled our bedroom, I lost my night lights. So I'm going to put a picture on the wall of you when you're gone here and I'm home alone here in like two weeks. I'm going to yeah. play a Ouija board and just try and invoke spirits to taunt you. They don't, I have to be there, you <laughs> idiot. That's not how it works. That doesn't even scare me. Go ahead. You are going to fuck yourself up. I can't wait for you to be home alone in that house. So many weird things. All right. We'll see. We'll see. I'll, I'll have my first experience of that soon. So we'll see oh, if I see anything. Yeah. I know you've never spent a night in our house alone. No. That'd be interesting. Oh, yeah. Good luck, buddy. Oh, man. It oh, geez. scary. Well, so, okay. Well, speaking of homes that are full of spirits, this next one is a very famous uh, haunted house. One of the most. 
the oh, win- was, before actually so but just like recap on that first story because yeah. we totally went off on a tangent there and sorry like fast forward to get to the second story it was really hard for me to um wrap my head around what you were saying about sao paulo mm-hmm. because when i was there mm-hmm. they told us not to go outside after five o'clock that it's a very unsavory very unsafe place mm-hmm. and basically like you're supposed to spend all your time inside in malls so like we were staying at this beautiful hotel and then they're like yeah you just take the elevator down to like the main floor and that's where like the mall is and the food yeah. and this but do not leave the building well, you were probably staying in the city of sao paulo right yeah there's also a, a state like a oh yeah yeah yeah. so the, the jabotikabal is in the state of sao paulo so so it wasn't in the same city that you're thinking got of. it because i was like what i'm like that place is not safe it's no, not it's, pretty it's, it's, it's terrifying it's far away it's hours away from where you are okay okay i mean that's awful though yeah what, what if our house started falling apart all around monroe that'd be crazy yeah, very unfortunate. So crazy. Mm-hmm. She has been a little moody lately. <laughs> well, I I didn't like the way that story ended. That was really sad. Yeah, yeah, terrible. I don't. Have we had any story where someone's killed themselves to avoid the possession? Uh, I can't think not of that any. I can think of. Not that I can think of. Yeah, that's a really unfortunate story. Yeah. Okay. I just I I just we leapt ahead and normally we recap and so I wanted to. <laughs> True. I'm just trying to follow the format of the show, Dan. <laughs> I know. You're a lunatic today. <laughs> You're so hopped up. It's like you act like we follow a tangent. You went ding, 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 ding on these other things, and then we went back, yeah. Because I was talking about poltergeist uh-huh. activity, which is, this is my life. Uh-huh. Having to explain myself. Are you ready? Fine. Fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> is Joe laughing out there? Probably. Uh, okay, so, every, so a little setup on this one. Okay. Everyone who knew a young Sarah Lockwood party, everyone who saw her wearing her elegant dresses and jewels and being tended to by numerous servants in the large, uh, lavish, lavish home in the stylish New Haven neighborhood where she grew up, expected her to continue to live an easy life. And for quite some time, that's exactly the life she did continue to live. Born in 1840, Sarah was the daughter of Sarah Burns and Leonard Party, a successful carriage maker in New Haven, Connecticut. The parties were wealthy and socially connected, and Sarah enjoyed all the luxuries of a cultured upbringing, including education at the best private schools and private piano and etiquette lessons. By the time she was in her teens, she spoke four languages, held her own in the most sophisticated of circles, and when she attended her debutante ball, she was announced and known as the Belle of New Haven. Her life was luxurious. She appeared poised for great future success. And then in 1862, 22-year-old Sarah married William Wirt Winchester. Son of Oliver Fisher Winchester, Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut, and the owner and founder of the famous Winchester Repeating Arms Company. Those early Winchester rifles were some of the first rifles capable of repeated discharges following a single ammunition reload, typical, uh, typically um, having multiple cartridges stored in a magazine and then fed into the chamber. Repeated Winchester rifles held a significant advantage over the preceding single-shot breech-loading rifles when used for military combat. They allowed a much faster and obviously important rate of fire, and William sold a lot of them and made a vast fortune. His only son, William, and William's wife, Sarah, were now set to receive. Okay. And this all plays into the story, too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, In addition to knowing that she'd never have to worry about money in an age when high society marriages were carefully arranged and characterized by long discussions about dowries and financial support, Sarah was very lucky to actually love and be loved by her husband. Life was beyond amazing for the young couple. Life continued to be glorious for the lady now known as Sarah Winchester, just like life always had been. The happy and wealthy young couple moved in the best New England social circles, making frequent social trips to Boston and New York. They dreamed and made plans for a large family. They wanted to have many children who could afford to provide such an incredibly privileged, uh, or they could afford to provide, you know, an incredibly privileged life for. Their wealth was increasing exponentially. In 1866, just four years after getting wed, the 1866 Winchester lever action came out and it was a very, very popular weapon. More than 720,000 rifles were quickly created. Sold at an original price of $20 per rifle, the Winchester 1873 was accessible to just about any gunman who wanted one. Wow. The gun became incredibly popular, not just in the States, but also overseas. France purchased 6,000 model 1866 rifles along with 4.5 million 44 Henry cartridges, essentially bullets, which Winchester factories also made during, oh my God. during the Franco-Prussian War. The Ottoman Empire purchased 45,000 model 1866 rifles. Holy crap. 5,000 carbines in 1870. And soon it seemed that just about every single family in America had one. The Winchester rifle came to be known as the gun that won the West. 
because of how often they were used in countless gunfights fought on the West's varied battlefields. From soldiers to cowboys, frontiersmen to bandits, just about everyone was holding a Winchester rifle. The Winchesters had entire nations, entire empires buying from them, and their wealth multiplied. And then also in 1866, the happy couple had their first child, a daughter, Annie. And right when it seemed like life couldn't possibly get any better, tragedy struck. No amount of money in the world can protect one from death, and death found the Winchesters in 1866. Their infant daughter, Annie, died of marasmus, severe undernourishment. What? In more simple terms, she starved to death. Her weight fell below 60% what it should have been. She just wouldn't feed. And Sarah was devastated. All the money, all the privilege, and it wasn't enough to save her baby. That's awful. She fell into a deep, dark depression, always wondering if there was something, anything she could have done differently. For sure. She tortured herself endlessly with thoughts of, why didn't I try this? Why didn't I try that? Constantly running scenarios and situations through her mind that led to her poor, frail, oh-so-thin little Annie not dying. She and William would never have another child, and Sarah would never be the same. A touch of melancholy would follow her for the rest of her many days. Fifteen years later, her beloved husband, William, who also never got over the death of little Annie, died as well at the age of 43. He died of what so many died of back then, consumption, a.k.a. tuberculosis. Oh. He died a year after his father had died and left him control of the company. A widow at 41, Sarah couldn't help but ask herself, what went wrong? Why was she not living the life she once felt destined to live? The one surrounded by a large family full of beautiful, healthy, and fabulously cared for children. The one where she would soon be a grandmother, doting on her grandchildren with her husband, William, at her side. Had she done something wrong? Was she cursed in some way? Desperate for answers to unanswerable questions, she consulted a medium. Time now for the tale of the Winchester Mystery House. Sarah traveled to Boston in the winter of 1881 to talk to this medium. She was led into a small room behind a curtain where she sat down with a spiritualist who looked deep into her eyes. Sarah stared back, paralyzed. And then after a long period of silence in a hushed tone, the medium told Sarah that she had indeed done something. She'd married into blood money. Oh. Her, Her child's death was in fact her fault. What? She told Sarah she was cursed by all the blood that had been spilled because of her deceased husband's rifles. She was being haunted by her fortune. The medium told Sarah she was being followed by many of the angry and restless spirits of those who had been killed by Winchester rifles. This army of the undead had first taken her daughter. They'd withered her away. They'd taken her husband, and now they were coming for her. Uh. Frightened and panicking, Sarah naturally asked the medium if there was anything she could do she could do to avoid the same fate as her daughter and husband. Was there any place to go where she would be safe? Could she ever escape this curse? The medium told her to go west and build a house for these spirits so that they might forgive her. An oddly specific strange task, to be sure. Uh Uh-huh. And then the medium wasn't done with her unusual instructions. She told Sarah that construction on this house could never, ever stop. It must exist in a perpetual state of construction, repair, and reconstruction. What? She warned, if you continue building, you will live. Stop, and you will die. Luckily, Sarah was financially equipped to carry out such a baffling, unnatural task. And she did it? When her husband died, she'd received an inheritance of $20 million. Holy crap. Equivalent to roughly half a billion in today's money. Yeah. Overcome with grief, frightened by the medium's instructions, the widowed Winchester heiress quickly left behind everything and everyone she knew and said goodbye to East Coast society and struck out on her own to San Jose, California. San Jose is now the center of the Silicon Valley. Then, a young city of around 12,000 people sprawled out in the middle of the sweeping vistas of the Santa Clara Valley. In 1884, she purchased an unfinished farmhouse and began building an enormous mansion, kicking off a nearly four-decade-long period of construction and renovation. Stop it. She employed a large crew of carpenters, men who split shifts so that construction could go on day and night, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, for 38 years. Holy shit. Sarah herself supervised the building process, nearly always wearing stifling, Florida neck-length funeral black dresses. Even in the hot San Juan sun, she'd wear them, where temperatures have been recorded to reach as high as 109 degrees. In 1897, when Sarah's mother-in-law died, Sarah received even more money to fund her construction. 
She inherited enough additional shares of Winchester stock to end up owning just under half of the company. And now, on top of all the money she already had, she was paid as one of the company's primary owners around $1,000 a day, equivalent to just under $30,000 a day now. Holy crap. Crap. More than enough money to continue building and building and building. And that's exactly what she did. She still worried about the blood money. She still worried about angry spirits she believed had killed her baby and her husband. Spirits she still thought were coming for her. Soon she'd built what's now known as the Winchester Mansion. She'd built it into the most lavish estate by far in San Jose. Situated on 161 acres of farmland, it included orchards of apricot, plum, and walnut trees. The home would end up featuring 950 doors, 10,000 windows, 40 different stairways, 52 skylights, 47 fireplaces, 6 kitchens, a ballroom, and once groundbreaking elements like wool insulation, carbide gas lights, electricity, an indoor shower, complete with an ahead of its time sewage drainage system. On one of the house's most beautiful and decadently uh, over the top features, uh, or one of them, was a hall of fires. It contained 47 fireplaces and 17 chimneys in one large room. That sounds insane. The home had three elevators and high-tech heating systems. Uh, Once a room was finished to the extent that any Winchester Mansion room was ever finished, it was adorned with some of the best furnishings money could buy. The house wasn't just continually being built, it was continually being built with the best material that money could buy. Freight cars loaded with gold and silver plated chandeliers, imported Tiffany art glass windows valued up to $1,500 each at the time, German silver and bronze inlaid doors, molded bathtubs, rare precious woods like mahogany and rosewood. Countless other items arrived in the San Jose rail station each and every week. All being built because a woman who most thought was mad believed that she must build. She must or they would come for her. Everything was transported to the house, but not everything would end up being installed. Sarah, never ceasing to heed the medium's warning, kept redoing most of the rooms. As she got older, her house, of course, grew stranger. Narrow, low-rise, claustrophobic switchback stairs were built to only accommodate the diminutive Winchester, who was only four feet ten and now suffering from crippling arthritis. Sarah's house had become a labyrinth. One could walk through what felt like miles of twisting hallways and secret passages in the 24,000 square foot home. Some of the passages led to dead ends. Numerous doors opened to blank walls. There was a dangerous door on the second floor that opened out into an alarming drop straight down into the yard below. Why? All built to Sarah's exact specifications. One of the few things the giant house didn't have were mirrors. Well, I get it. For years, there were no mirrors at all. Why? Sarah thought that the mirrors could and would anger the ghost she was hiding from. She thought these spirits could be seen in the mirrors, and she did not want to see them. Sarah was so afraid of ghosts that during a time when most houses had few electric lights, if any, and were mostly lit by candles, Sarah designed her house to be constantly full of electric light, with modern lamps filling every room. The shadows created by candlelight were too much for her. I get it. They can make shadows appear uh, to be creatures moving about on their own. And if Sarah saw shadows moving, she wanted to know they were indeed spirits and not just tricks of light. Sarah also loaded the house full of the number 13. Windows had 13 panes of glass. Their home, uh, the home had 13 bathrooms, 13 wall panels, 13 steps on almost every staircase, 13 candles on the chandeliers, 13 coat hooks in the seance room. And yes, there was a room devoted to communicating with spirits. Why would she do that? Sarah spent a tremendous amount of time in this room alone. When the sun went down most evenings, Sarah would retire to this room, located in, the, in a peaked turret of the house, and she wouldn't come out for several hours. That's so creepy. She often worked on her architectural plans for the house in that room, even though she'd never studied architecture. After a late night conversing or attempting to converse with the dead, the following morning, she would deliver new construction plans to her foreman. It seems as if Sarah's design plans may have been guided, or at least she thought they were being guided, by spirits she was running from. One day, a construction worker peeked in and spied on her, curious as to what Sarah was doing for hours alone each night in this room. Yeah, I'd, I'd want to know. He claimed to see her light a series of candles and then take a seat. After a few moments, her eyes started to roll back in her head and her face contorted into what looked like a ghastly scream with no sound. Weird. She does all this while she thinks no one is watching. At least not no one who's alive. Is this what she was doing night after night, hours at a time? The construction worker watched her lift a trembling hand and eyes still rolled back. She began to write. 
The next morning, the same construction worker claimed he saw the same piece of paper Sarah had written on being handed over to his foreman. The handwriting, he noticed, did not look like the handwriting on his paycheck. It didn't look like Sarah's handwriting. Oh. Was it automatic writing? Was Sarah really channeling spirits who were designing this macabre house? Sarah held seances constantly at the Winchester house, sometimes with others, often alone. Some said she held seances nearly every night. She definitely thought she was communicating with something on a regular basis. I mean, it's a little Peggy-ish. Perhaps because of her peculiar activities, Sarah spent an unusual amount of money on making sure her servants lived in comfort. She bought their loyalty and bought their silence. Because of this, they refused to tell curious neighbors and curious journalists what Sarah was up to. Even after Sarah died, many of them wouldn't speak of exactly had, what had gone on inside the Winchester mansion. I mean, that's kind of amazing. Sarah's sa staff saved her life in 1906 when the Great San Francisco Earthquake caused three floors of the then seven-story house... Seven stories? ...to cave in. Sarah was trapped in one of the home's many bedrooms. Her staff had to dig her out. Wow. And after digging her out, they got right back to building. <laughs> Fourteen years later, on September 5th, 1922, the construction finally came to an end. The strange, secretive, haunted Sarah Winchester passed away in her sleep at the age of 83. Was she finally reunited with her husband and infant daughter? Despite her passing, some of the spirits she both hid from and talked with in her Winchester mansion seemed to have remained. Visitors to the house have been reporting strange sights and sounds coming from inside the Winchester mansion for nearly a hundred years now. One spirit in particular has been witnessed over and over again, a man in white coveralls. Sometimes the specter holds a wheelbarrow. All the visitors who claim to have witnessed him report the same sequence of events. The spirit first stares at them, then raises a hand as if to greet them, and then just vanishes into thin air. None of the crews who worked on Sarah's home for years are known to have died on the grounds of her home. None of the crew members. So who was this man? Just two years after Sarah's death... One of my favorite 20th century skeptics visited her home after hearing rumors of her home being haunted. Harry Houdini. Oh, yeah. Houdini hated fake spiritualists who tried to scare and swindle people with their talk of being able to communicate with the dead. He loved debunking these claims and he decided to visit the Winchester mansion to prove that all the rumors were nonsense. Houdini took a tour of the strange home and spent the bulk of his time in Sarah's seance room where he asked to be left alone. When he came down from the tower a few hours later, he was reportedly pale, and it looked as if his hands were shaking. When pressed, he wouldn't admit that he'd seen anything, but he did admit that he couldn't disprove the presence of spirits in the Winchester house. And he admitted that something about the house just felt wrong. When Sarah died, all of her possessions, apart from the house itself, were bequeathed to her niece and personal secretary. Her niece to, uh, sold the house at an auction to a local investor for over $135,000, and then the home was leased for 10 years to a couple named John and Mamie Brown. Oh, why would you want to stay there? In February of 1923, just five months after Sarah Winchester died, the Winchester house was open to the public, and Mamie served as the first tour guide. Oh, okay. And tours continue to this day. Guides give historical tours during the day, and flashlight ghost tours at night. Uh. And every year, there are sightings. Visitors see orbs, hear unexplained organ music, fog-like people appear and vanish. Numerous visitors have felt something touch them or tug on their hair. Uh-uh, uh-uh. One visitor said, My husband and I took the flashlight tour and we were stopped in the kitchen, standing by the French doors, waiting for everyone else to catch up. I glanced down and realized I'd almost stepped on a little white dog. I jumped, grabbed my husband, and we both looked down. Nothing was there. I didn't think much of it, since I don't believe in ghosts, or didn't, and decided it must have been something outside. A week later, my mom was looking through a Winchester book I had purchased and noticed the same dog. It was Sarah Winchester's dog. Oh my gosh. Another visitor saw a different spirit. I saw a man in coveralls appear right in front of me, holding up his hammer. As soon as I looked away and back, he vanished. Later, I got a heavy feeling in my chest, as though someone was sitting on it. As soon as I left the house, the pain vanished. And another guest recalled, As I walked into the seance room, I saw a ball of light or orb fly from one part of the room to the next. The orb landed on a table, and when I looked up, a female figure was sitting in the chair directly next to the table. Shut the fuck up. She was smiling. Dark hair spilled down from her head onto the table. I left immediately. There are unseen forces out there. You need to know some of these forces can be dangerous. Never go ghost hunting. Sometimes the ghost hunts you. Several years ago, 
A man working on one of the many restoration projects in the mansion started his day in the Hall of Fires. The house was dead quiet before tours got underway, and he was working up on a ladder when he felt someone tap him on the back. Oh, God. He turned to ask what the person wanted, and no one was there. Telling himself it was just his imagination, he went back to his work, and then he felt someone pushing him in the back again, hard. Way too hard to just be his imagination. Oh, God. He hurried down the ladder, crossed the estate, and started on another project, figuring that someone or something didn't want him in the Hall of Fires that morning. Yeah. Just a few years ago, a tour guide named Samantha led visitors to the Daisy Bedroom, a room where Sarah Winchester was trapped for several hours following that 1906 earthquake. Yeah. Samantha heard a clear sigh come from the small hallway outside the bedroom door, and she initially thought one of her guests had fallen behind. She turned to call the person into the room, but no one was there. Then, as her eyes adjusted to the darkened hallway, she saw it. The form of a small, dark person, slowly emerging, gliding around a corner. Oh my god. Just a dark outline with no distinct features. And then Samantha heard another deep sigh come from whatever this thing was. Ha! She now thinks it was the ghost of Sarah herself, still roaming the halls of the home she never stopped working on. Is Sarah still hiding from the spirits she once ran from in life? That story is so insane. Isn't that crazy? I mean, it's one of those stories I think is really interesting where take the spirit spirit part out of it. Just the fact that she did that for so many years. That's what I kept getting hung up on. That's like on, for a while, that's all I could think about. I'm like, she in a way she was mentally ill. She just had gone right. mad. Right. Just her grief drove her insane. I, I mean, to me, that's what it sounds like. Right? I mean, because it's like what? Why else would she do that? Right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, okay, she did it because she thought it would keep her alive, but obviously, like, this the death of her daughter. And how weird. I think it's weird that the daughter starved to death. That is so oh, yeah. weird to me. I, I That little fact is really upsetting to me because it's not like they didn't have the money. Well, like, were there doctors involved? I mean, like, why? There were she- doctors involved, but th- that actually wasn't... Um, incredibly uncommon back then i mean now oh, really? with, yeah now with modern medicine you know you can like be force fed that wasn't an option back then like no so, intravenous feeding right so if a baby just like refused to feed like some babies do uh, yeah. on like a nipple or a bottle yeah then the baby just died oh <sighs> god yeah. that's awful mm-hmm. i guess i didn't think about uh modern technology in that right. sense i was just thinking that yeah, I mean, maybe the baby was possessed and like maybe it really was yeah. some revenge. I mean, what, a, what a weird thing for the medium to tell her to do. True. And that and that's the big thing with the story where... Like, is she uh, just a sick, twisted person who right. also hated them and then decided, oh, maybe, this is my uh, chance to torture you? I know. Maybe maybe someone ha- close to her had died in a war right. or in a gunfight or something and she had some axe to grind uh, with the person making all the money off of these specific rifles. You never know. Yeah. The, the, but the, the fact that she did it, and with the seance room, mm-hmm. yikes. Would you go there? Uh, I would. I would check it out. Would you do a nighttime tour? Yeah, I would do a nighttime you tour would? with a group. Yeah, that would be very interesting. I, I always say that I would do these things, but then I start to think about myself in these situations, and here's what I'm going to say. If we ever do these things, yeah. I want to be like in the middle, and I want a lot of people around me. Sure. I can never not have someone that I know and trust. Yeah just completely surrounding me so we're gonna have to have a lot of people fair fair i might i might want two layers of security okay okay like inner circle next circle we, we did get an invite uh ne- if we go to st louis together and we can't to, we, yeah, to, to stay at the lamp mansion i know so that would be pretty cool to do <sighs> mm-hmm. i mean yes but also there's gonna be a lot of alcohol involved for me <laughs> like so much so here's some i mean this house is so fascinating sure sure Here, here's a picture from uh uh 1905 wow I mean, look at how much was built. It's just such a crazy looking house. I mean, that is crazy that they built that. <sighs> yeah. It's uh, continued. How, how long did it take? 40, uh, 38 years. 38 years. You know what's crazy is that in China, they build a hospital in like six days. Oh my God, seriously? Yeah, because of the coronavirus. Wow. Oh my God. Um, here, Here's an aerial view uh, of the home from the uh, early 20th century. I mean, it's a palatial it's a beautiful estate. estate. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, yeah. So here's one of the homes, many hallways. I found this uh, picture just to be creepy. Oh, God. Right? Yeah. It's like walking down these narrow, long hallways in this huge maze of a house. Right, right. Well, and also like 
a different time, right? So there's not tons of lights on the wall. and Right. You she know. Did, it was ahead of its time with electric light, but still yes, not but the still, same as today. Not like what no. we would have. I mean, if that was a modern hallway, there would be like eight sconces. and. <laughs> right, right. This next... That hallway is... Oh, my God. Do you see that? Like, Yeah, it's like a weird trick of light down there at the end. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, this next room is known as the Witch's Cap in the South Turret. Okay. Just an odd room. There's all those turrets in the house. And that's not that's not the seance room? Uh, no. This is, uh, I couldn't the find a picture of the turrets. seance room that she had uh, online. But this is a room that she would just go hang out in. I mean, it's a weird little it's, room. Uh, one thing that I was getting hung up on when you were telling the story is like, she would furnish the house. I'm like, mm-hmm. but if you can never stop construction, I thought in my mind, I was like, oh, she's going to build it, tear it down, build it again, build it, tear it down, build it again. No, no she, she just, just kept, kept adding, expanding, adding, adding, expanding, adding. expanding, expanding. Right, right. So crazy. I was like, why are you filling it with so much furniture? You're not going to have friends over. <laughs> right. Just build the house. They didn't say anything about having to decorate it. Right. Yeah, I guess she just I wanted mean, it to be decorated. Right. I mean, she had all she was the, obsessed. the money. Right. This next picture is, is of young Sarah Winchester. Okay. I mean, so, you know, it's a little like, kind of like one of those painting type pictures. Right, right. Pretty. I mean. And then this last one is just a weird, this is one of those stairways that just goes to nowhere. I, I don't understand. It's just a stairway that, that goes into a Well, but think about, I mean, she's she thinks she thinks she either is or she thinks she is communicating with some undead force. That tells her She's to going into this? the room night after night after night for year after year after year, going into this little trance and doing this automatic writing, whether it's her unconscious, subconscious, or some kind of spirit. And then that's where she gets her inspiration for the next, uh, you know, uh, layout. Portion or yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, she, she didn't just um, oversee that. She designed this whole thing. But she, that's so weird. But she wasn't an architect. She was just like, I want this turret and I want this room to be, you know, whatever this size. And I want this stair to go into the ceiling. I want this door to open up into nothing. It was madness. Okay, so you see that one pipe that's in the middle? Mm-hmm. And there's like a thing at that the That might end? be new. That's like, That looks like to me like I know. A, a, um, a... A spigot, like... It's for putting out fires. I'm blanking on the term. But that's just... um. If the fire alarm goes off, yeah. it's a sprinkler. Sprinkler. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was like, that doesn't make sense because that would, wouldn't fit the times. But yeah, that must that be That was some added post modern, her death. Uh, modification. Sure, sure. To come up to fire code or whatever. Yikes. Yeah. Any, anything else? No, that's it. Okay, okay. I was getting nervous that you were going to spook me with a... I don't know, a, a scary Sarah photo. No, I, I can't. I, I got to keep you guessing. I can't have them on every single story. Whoa. That was weird. Yeah, it's just an really story. peculiar. Mm-hmm. It sits with you, huh? Mm-hmm. All that, yeah. It's like, a, I guess like a modern equivalent. It would be like if uh, a, a Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett just went Bezos. mad. Be- yeah, Bezos. Okay, but yeah, one of those, one of those, you know, Amazon guy, Microsoft. It, anybody you know, with a shitload of money. Berkshire Hathaway. Right. Anyone right, anyone right. with a t- ton of money just went mad and, and dedicated their fortune to just something very specific and insane. And was it twenty four hour a day, seven days that's a week construction? Yeah, like that's insane. She had to keep building the whole time, or she thought the spirits would get her. And who knows what that meant? That could have been like one handyman. Just, work, working on yeah. some trim Ooh. in the corner of the house, but like, what a weird I thing! I wouldn't want to like, be by myself. Right, right. I would be like, okay, yeah, I'll take the job only if I get a partner. Yeah, and, there, and there's not a lot of detail. I mean, she was extremely private and secretive about the whole thing. About the whole, th- about her whole life. She didn't. She wasn't like going out around town. She wasn't like the you know. Once she moved out to San Jose, yeah, she was holed up in that house for almost forty years. Obsessed with building that thing, and she had her servants, and um, you know, uh, I, I'm not sure. She feels possessed. Yeah, it was very, very, very strange. There's very few pictures of her. Very, f- I mean, yeah, we don't know a lot about exactly what she did. All you know, other yeah. than just pursue constant construction. <sighs> so strange. Mm-hmm. Do you want to hear some stories? I do. I, w- I was going to offer you my rose quartz if you want to hold it. Nope, I'm good. It's I got so- my little thing. I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want it. I got my own stuff. Okay. Awkward. Oh, I was just trying to share. It's just so um ah. That's a ga- it's a gateway crystal. That's how you lure me in. <laughs> Something that feels good. It's not a gateway crystal. It just is comfortable to hold on to. It's like people have like worry dolls or things yeah. that they hold on to or like I mean when I was a kid I heard of like worry stones. It's the same idea. Yeah, yeah. My god. Crystal mania. All right. Are you Ready. I am. Okay. Uh, 
So a Ouija board story. Oh, okay. Yeah, we haven't done like a lot of Ouija boards. Yeah, board. I haven't had one in a little while. Yeah, yeah. So I think that this is more reasons not to play with Ouija boards. Hey everyone, it's Scared to Death. I've been a longtime fan of Dan's comedy and just recently discovered both the podcasts. Keep up the great work, everyone. You got it. Thank you. The following story you're about to read is about a coworker of mine named Shane. We work for a police department, which immediately like gave this story so much credit. Okay. I was like, okay, okay cops. Yeah. Uh, and when I heard the details of his story, I knew it would be very out of character for Shane to lie about something so serious in so much detail. This real-life horror movie he is experiencing is still ongoing and developing as I write this. Weird. I know. Here we go. It all started when Shane and a group of his friends decided to spend the night in a haunted hotel for Shane's birthday. Eek. They got a room at the Menger Hotel, which is in downtown San Antonio, Texas, right down the street from the Alamo. Okay, okay. Yeah. This hotel has a very deep and rich history, was built 23 years after the fall of the Alamo in 1859. Shane's friend and roommate thought it would be appropriate to bring a Ouija board to the room that night, which, right, like, of right. course. Mm -hmm. They used the Ouija board and got several responses to their questions. The most chilling answer they received when they asked, how many spirits are in the room with us? The board then replied, seven. After the Ouija board shenanigans, they all went to sleep in the room, all except for Shane, who could not get any sleep that night. He kept being woken by a child's voice saying his name. Weird. His first thought was that his friends were messing with him, but then quickly realized that what was occurring after discovering all of his friends were dead asleep in the room was actually happening. He was terrified and stayed up all night while hearing the child's voice repeat his name over and over and over. So weird. Eventually, he survived the night in the Manger Hotel, but this was only the beginning of terrible occurrences to come. He recently moved into a new apartment with his roommate that was also at the hotel with him. Nothing weird happened in the first in sorry, nothing happened at first in the new apartment, but on the last day of getting things from their old apartment, Shane noticed a weird two foot tall statue on his back porch. Huh. This statue was made out of a tower of leaves and flowers attached to a plywood base. The leaves and flowers were covered in this shiny and thick embalming preservative type substance that held it all together. When Shane picked up the statue and touched the leaves to see what it was made of, it burned his hands. Immediately terrified, he found the closest dumpster to his apartment and threw the thing away. It was then that weird things would start happening in his new apartment. Shane and his roommate are the only residents in the building of their new apartment due to renovations happening in the entire complex. Yeah. They would often hear loud banging and knocking on the walls and doors when neither of them were near the location of the noise. On several occasions, they would hear something mimicking both of their voices. What? This would ha always happen when one would knock on the other's door before coming in. So, Shane knocked on his roommate's door and heard a voice say, Come on in. When he entered the room, he found his roommate dead asleep and woke him up, confused to the fact that Shane had come in his room in the first place. He explained to his roommate that he thought he heard his roommate say, Come on in. His roommate said, No. I was asleep. Another similar incident happened, only this time it was Shane that heard come on in from his roommate's room. The roommate was on the other side of the apartment. This strange activity wasn't just limited to Shane and his roommate, though. One time, Shane was home alone in the shower, getting ready for work. When he got out of the shower, he found the apartment, apartment maintenance man standing in their living room. Shane asked him why he was in the apartment. The man asked first, are you the only one home? Shane said, yeah, why? The man said, so weird. I knocked and said, maintenance. Yeah. And then someone said, come on in. What? And the door unlocked. What? Other strange things began to occur in the apartment. Shane once saw, a sh once saw a shadow person walk into his roommate's room. Shane's cats would stare at corners of the apartment without moving for minutes. His cats, who used to love his roommate, would now hiss at him for what seemed like no reason. His roommate never had weird sleep habits his entire life, but then started to have sleep paralysis and would sometimes sleepwalk into Shane's room in the middle of the night, Ugh. totally unresponsive to Shane calling his name. 
One night, coming home from a night out with friends, they saw a dark figure by the pool at about 3 a.m., the witching hour. The next morning, they reported the after-hours use of the pool to the management. The manager said they saw no one using the pool that night on the cameras on the video. Right. Things took a horrible turn for the worse on October 31st, 2019. On Halloween night, Shane, his roommates, and 13 of their friends went out to a bar and had plans to visit a graveyard afterwards. During their partying at the bar, their group was approached by a very attractive young man who struck up conversation with the group. This man became the center of the group's attention with his magnetic personality and instantly became the life of their party. The group told the man of their plans after the bar and invited him to the graveyard with them. The man convinced the group that he had a better idea. The man said he knew of a place called a demon graveyard. What? He explained that it wasn't a graveyard in the traditional sense. There were no headstones, but humans had been buried there. But it was a place where people had... Oh, I'm sorry. There were no headstones and buried humans there. But it was a place where people have summoned demons in the past and that their energy was still there like a graveyard for demons. That's, I've never heard of something like that. Sounds insane. Somehow, the man received zero objection from the group and paid for all four Ubers to take the group to the demon graveyard. What? Uh-huh. Shane would like to add here that he had no idea about the demon graveyard and thought they were all going to McDonald's. Otherwise, he says he would have never agreed to go. Okay, good. Because I, I, I was starting to think that Shane felt a little Darren-esque, where it's like you're having these problems and now you're going to a demon graveyard. <laughs> That's not going to make anything better. It's not going to help. Shane said the ride was almost an hour out of town and that they traveled on a dirt road until they came to a forest. They trekked through the forest until they came across a clearing surrounded by trees on all sides. Shane then explained that what happened next would change the, change the lives of all of his friends forever. The strange man began to speak in Latin and began to perform some sort of ritual by himself that instantly terrified the group. Then the man began to levitate several feet what? off the ground. A ring of fire erupted on the ground where the man was standing. It was at this point that Shane completely blacked out. The next thing he knew, it was 9 a.m. and he was in his bed with a large scratch on his back. Confused and terrified, Shane began to call and text all 13 of his friends in the group to find out what the hell had happened. They all remembered seeing the same thing. The man speaking Latin, the man levitating, what? the fire all around, all before each of them blacking out and then waking up in their beds the next day. Shane went to his roommate to see if he remembered the same thing as the others. The roommate said he didn't black out like the others did. He remembered everything that happened, and no matter how hard Shane has pressed him for the truth, his roommate refuses to speak about what happened that night. Sincerely, Sean O., terrified co-worker. That is one of the craziest fucking stories I've ever heard in my life. If they didn't work in a police department, right. I feel like I'd be like, this is absolute bullshit. And I don't know why I'm just like giving them credit, right, 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 right. because obviously it could still be bullshit, but right. like, why take the time what? to write this story? And there's so many weird coincidences. 13 friends, Halloween, 3 a.m. shadow person. Yeah. Oh, man. That story, I would never be, I would never be the same if I experienced something like that. I think that's the point. And the friend is not saying what happened or, or what they right. remember. There's one of the 13, sure, there's sure. one the, friend the, that's the, like, the I did not pass out and doesn't want to talk about it. Like, how much therapy do you think he's getting? <laughs> right, right. And then for me, just like I don't, I don't know what. Would, well, I don't know what would be worse. I guess like the knowing or the not knowing. I guess obviously it depends on what the knowing is entails. But, but just the the part of going there and then not knowing what happened and having that happen to everybody. That would, I mean, if that happens to you, you're never the same. Like if you were a skeptical person before, and then right. that happens, you you don't ever get to be skeptical again. No, for, of of anything really. Like it would just oh fuck God. up your whole worldview. <laughs> right. Right. Ah, yeek. Can you handle one more? Yeah, okay. yeah, that, that is a very strange tale. It's very, very peculiar. And, and, and of course, you know, I didn't know what you were going to talk about. So it, it's just kind of like <sighs> weird in combination with the house building. Like just... Just a lot of weird shit out there. Yeah, like not necessarily uh, obviously terrifying. Right. But just sort of Spooky. like, what the fuck? What goes on in the world? Also, like, what kind of drugs are they doing? 
<laughs> I just I also love that Shane was like, I thought we were going to get food. Clearly like drunk. Yeah. Having yeah. a good time and thought like, sweet, time for a Big Mac. And then gets God. dragged out to some forest. I met I met the listener out in St. Louis who told that story about they were uh, driving kind of out in the middle of nowhere and they saw those people around the fire. Oh yeah! Oh, you and, met that person, uh, the girl, and then and then they were gone. And she, I was just like, "What the fuck?" And she's like, "I know." She's did she like, seem really creeped out by it? Just like she kind did. of recalling she, it. She seemed very normal, and yeah. she seemed creeped out by that experience. And just like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Wish I knew. You know, kind of what was going on out there. I would love it oh if God. like somebody. Hurt. There was a fan of this show, heard it, and then was like, oh, yeah, that was me and my friends having a bonfire. <laughs> we did that to like, we do that all the time to see if we, we have can a bonfire. scare people. We dug a little bunker uh, out in the woods to hide in after the fire to weird people out. <laughs> right. We do, we do it every weekend from 9 to 10. <laughs> right, right. Right. We, we go to great lengths to spook people. Yeah. That would be great. Mm -hmm. I would love those people. Oh, I'd love that. I'd love those stories to come through. Cause, oh, okay. Maybe things aren't as scary out there as we, I sometimes think. Yeah. I, th I think things are pretty fucked up out there. Um, so I put these stories together last week and mm -hmm. now I'm like seeing what I, I like, make oh, myself no. a little note. I'm like, shit. <laughs> my note to myself is as much as I don't want to, I'm doing this story mostly because this fan was so sure his story would not be chosen because I'm so afraid of the hat man and shadow people. Eek. Eek. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey, my name is Shane. Another Shane. That's yeah. weird. Longtime listener of Time Suck, going on two years now. Thank you. I am loving getting my extra dose of the Cumminses each week on Scared to Death. My story involves shadow people, though I, I don't know that it was that. I didn't know it was called that until I listened to my very first episode of Time Suck and after researching what happened to me. I still don't know if, if what you're about to read is simply an episode of Sleep Paralysis okay. or a genuine wide awake experience, but I can assure you everything felt very, very real. About two years ago, when I was a sophomore in high school, I used to wake up at 5 a.m. Oh, my God, I'm remembering this story now. Oh, no. I used to wake up at 5 a.m. to go for a run with my cousin, who lived directly next door to me. Okay. Usually, we would both wake up, but occasionally, one of us would have to sneak into the other's house and pull the other one out of bed. And that was the agreement we made with each other. More often than not, it was me waking him up, okay. not the other way around. On this particular morning, however, for some unknown reason, I was awoken about five minutes before my alarm went off. I only knew this because the clock was on my bedside table. What woke me was the door to my bedroom that I shared with my yet much younger brother slowly opening. The first thought I had was that it was my cousin coming to get me for our run. But then I knew that couldn't be right. Like I said, usually I have to wake him up and he's the stubborn one that doesn't get up. Also, the fact that my alarm hadn't gone off yet mean, meant it was too early, and so he was definitely right. not awake. It was at this moment that I realized something was very, very off. The creaking of my bedroom door reached a halt, and I attempted to turn my body from the position I was in on my back to roll over and face the door across the room, but it felt like I couldn't move. I somehow managed to turn just my head and did so very, very slowly. What I saw in the doorway still haunts me to this day. It was, it was the shape of my cousin and wearing what in the dark had looked like what he usually wore on those runs, black gym shorts along with a self-made sleeveless sweater. However, when I saw his face, I knew it was not him. Weird. His face was non-existent and in its place, a jet black void that was also somehow seemingly tangible. Standing in the doorway frozen, he seemed to stare into my room. My breathing became heavier, and it felt as if an elephant was sitting on my chest as I began to panic. I tried to say, Junior, is that you? But the words would not leave my mouth. As the thing stepped into my bedroom, it approached the bunk bed where I slept on the bottom and my younger brother slept on the top. As it got closer, it seemed to grow taller and taller. It didn't want me, though. It walked towards the bunk bed and stopped right where my younger brother's head would have been. It stood there, possibly staring at my brother. I tried to roll over. Slowly, I began to move towards the edge of the bed, but then I fell off my bed and landed on my back, staring up at the tall creature. I could see it staring at my brother, and then slowly, it looked down at me. It cocked its head, and somehow, through the void, I saw a smirk. 
it reached down, grabbed me by my legs, swung me with inhumane strength into my dresser, and yet somehow I didn't even touch my dresser. The next thing I knew, I was inexplicably in the hallway. It seemed wider than usual. I kept telling myself, this is a dream. It's just Mm -hmm. a dream. It's just a dream. I stared down the hallway into the darkness. I could somehow see as though it was daytime, even though there was zero lights on. About halfway down the hall was a small gas generator that I had never seen before. My parents' bedroom door is at the very end of the hall. I felt a strong urge to run to their room. I sprinted down the hall, and on my way, I pushed the never-before-seen generator into our laundry room door, and again, I had inhumane strength, and I sent it flying into the darkness. I got to the end of the hall. I think think you meant inhuman strength on those two. Inhuman? Mm -hmm. What did I say? Inhumane. What's the difference? I've never heard any. I've never heard the word inhumane before. Like, like you're not being nice. And inhuman would be like really like more than human strength. Thank, thank you for ruining the whole story. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to keep saying now. it. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Well, you just ruined the whole thing. You just took us completely out of oh, it. Sorry. Oh man, if I corrected you during stories, you would lose your shit. Uh, You're in so much trouble. I got to the end of the hall and burst through the doors. As I entered my parents' room, I tripped on something and went flying into the air over my parents' bed across the to the other side of the room. The scariest part is that I was, as I was like flying, seemingly in slow motion over the bed, I looked down at what was going on around me. My stepmom was sound asleep on her side of the bed under a comforter I didn't recognize. On my dad's side, however, was not my dad. In his uh. place was a tall, slim man wearing a black suit and a black brim hat. His face, nothing but that black void. And somehow he too had that weird smirk. I crawled into the master bathroom. I tried to turn around to close the door behind me, but when I did, he, it, was standing in the doorway, long arms at its side. He walked towards me and I was paralyzed with fear. Just like before, when he threw me into my dresser, he grabbed my legs and swung me into the wall that I shared that shared the, with, the, with the bedroom. As I hit the wall, I found myself back in my bed somehow. I laid there for five seconds trying to comprehend what had happened. Five minutes of absolute horror ending just in time for my alarm to go off. I got out of bed and went for my run. Later that day, my stepmom called me into her room and asked me if she'd seen where I'd left her book. Mm-hmm. When I entered the bedroom, I saw on her bed the comforter from what I had thought was a terrible dream. I asked her, where did that come from? And she said that our great Dane had had an accident on her other comforter and she bought this new one today. I know for a fact I had never, ever seen that blanket before. And the thing is, is she had gotten the new comforter while I was at school. Mm -hmm. So it couldn't have been there at the time I was having this experience. Was this just a crazy, crazy coincidence or perhaps one of future hauntings from previous episodes? Oh, yeah. Everyone I tell the story to says it was just sleep paralysis paralysis and I must have subconsciously seen the comforter somewhere before and coincidentally it was in my dream. To this day I'm jumpy when people wake me up and I have trouble getting back to sleep after someone comes into my room while I'm trying to sleep. Love listening to the show got up got caught up on it at my job as a night stalker in a grocery store. I've definitely been scared shitless by coworkers coming to me asking me for something while I'm deep in the zone of restocking and listening to a scary ass story. My favorite time is when a manager tapped my shoulder while I was sticking pick while I was stocking pickles and listening to the chain strangler story. I dropped and shattered a large jaw while ye- jar while yelling, Jesus fucking Christ, man. He laughed his ass off and as I tried to explain things to him. Thanks again, guys. Keep up the great work. Yeek. Yeah, that is one of those ones where it's like, is it a dream? But then, but then that one detail of the comforter, because I kept thinking dream, dream, dream. Me too. Me too. Just I was because like, of like eh. the weird things like bigger hallway and then yes. it's the people from my life, but not the people from my life. Right. Like all those dream elements. And I'm being thrown around, but I'm not getting hurt. Right. And I'm and showing like, up in a hallway after... I just, you know, after being thrown into a dresser, it's like... Yeah, and I'm, like, flying in the air over top of, like... That doesn't even make sense. Like, you run into your mom's room and you fly over top of the bed. Like, I couldn't, like, run into my bedroom, any bedroom... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. ...and jump across a bed. Right. Like, it doesn't... What? 
Yeah, but then that comforter detail. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, strange. I mean, and there's all these weird things with sleep paralysis where I don't know. It's it's there. Sleep sleep paralysis is a real phenomenon. It's like right. like it's been scientifically studied, but but I don't know that, that necessarily negates other things well it doesn't negate other things also possibly being real that aren't you know scientifically right. studied and it's like what if there's some weird combination like what if when your brain goes right, into that right. state that's when other entities can choose to mess with you it's just it's also strange and then the the mm-hmm. line between the dream world and the real world and mm-hmm. the, the blurring of that i mean how many times have you had a horrible horrible nightmare yeah. that feels so real and you're like telling yourself to wake up i mean have you ever had one where you like wake up crying or sweating or just sweating. like yeah a lot, many years ago yeah yeah I, yeah i haven't had a terrible terrible nightmare in a long time i mean excuse me uh my night nightmares now are more like very real if real life things happening that are not they don't involve um paranormal activity or anything they're more yeah. like somebody dying or like being in a terrible car yep, accident. Yep. And they don't even feel like premonitions necessarily. They're just generally I'm like, oh yeah, well, I watched that movie four days ago and like something bad happened or, right. you know, I'll hear that like one of my friends' spouses cheated on them. So then like I have a weird dream about cheating. Like sure, they're much sure. more like real, yeah, yeah, but they're yeah. just terrifying because you're like, it feels emotional. It doesn't feel scary. Yeah, It's very yeah. different. Yeah. When I was a kid, I would have, Horrible nightmares. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I haven't had them uh, as an adult that I can think of. Not the same way as when I was a kid where I had like genuine nightmares mm-hmm. about, you know, uh, paranormal horror. Monsters. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now it's more like what you said. Well, I, I, I barely remember my dreams. It's been years since I really remembered a dream. I do remember when we first started dating, I would have the most vivid dreams for the longest you time. Did. Yeah, for the first couple of years. And now it just kind of seems to have dissipated. I don't know why that happens. I don't know if it's like actually how deep you're sleeping. I don't know. Or, I mean, yeah, it's it's very strange. <laughs> I wonder if it's like for you with those two, it's like a level of security or something too, though, because it felt like a, a disproportionate amount of your bad dreams where I was doing something horrible. Always. Right. It was. I, I was. I was cheating. Always I was cheating. <laughs> you're naughty. <laughs> I was doing something. I didn't love you anymore. Or then sometimes it would be yeah. that I died. Or, yeah. But it was always like, I'm like, because I because I remember for a while there, you'd be like, oh, I had another dream in my head. I'd be like, ah, oh, fuck, here we go. Hey, what did I do this <laughs> but time? I was, I was what, did I, the, what did I, what did not me do this time in your head? But I was never mad at you. So no, no, people no, you get weren't. weird about that where they're like then frustrated with the person. <laughs> right. It's like, that doesn't make sense. You're the one that dreamt it. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but this one, just that, the detail of the comforter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's so peculiar. That's a weird end note. And like, he's a young guy, so he's not out comforter shopping. That's not like... <laughs> right, right. You know what I mean? For like, a, what is he, maybe 17, 18 years old? Yeah. You know? Like, if he was maybe like a 45-year-old woman who was redecorating her house, I'd be like, okay. Right, you looked at that comforter somewhere else before. Yeah. I don't know. Very strange. But you know, you're saying like about the sleep paralysis, yeah. and maybe there is like some weird combination of that and paranormal activity. I mean, I feel like in the vast majority of our stories, what we're finding or what we believe is that it's somebody who is more susceptible. So it's like when someone is sick, when it's a young child, when you're asleep, these yeah. things seem to happen. I mean, it's never really like, oh, you know, this person who is totally, completely fine and not young. Like there are so many boxes that would have to be checked. So it's like, yeah, yeah I feel like sleep paralysis would make you more susceptible to hauntings because you're very vulnerable when you're sleeping and bonus add the sleep paralysis to it. Right, right. Right? Like if you suddenly were possessed, I would be really fucking terrified because you're you're not really sure if you believe in it or not. You're very level headed, you're very logical, you're healthy. Like do you know, like Yeah. I would it would freak me out more than if like uh your 87 year old grandfather said he saw shit. I'd be like, yeah, sure, you're sure, old. sure, sure, sure. You're sure. susceptible. Right, right, exactly. I mean, I, I, yeah, I definitely, I try not to see things. That's where I know that's this is where stu- we're different. Yeah. I, that's where this stuff uh, clearly bothers me on some level. And I joke about that on stage right now. Oh, where, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're like during the day, I'm totally skeptical and fine. Yeah. But when I'm, when I get up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night or I'm, I'm in my hotel room by myself, uh, I don't watch scary movies anymore. I don't watch scary sh- stories anymore because I have as too of, much like, of this the, stuff what, in my the last, head. Like, month? As of we started doing this. Like, that's not true because you watched. Oh, no, no, no. I did watch a little bit. As, Liar. Just, true. Just, just lately. Just lately. That's right. I forgot that it had taken a while. 
Yeah, because you were just what you were just watching some show on Netflix. It was some scary doll uh, show. I did watch the scary show on Netflix, but I wouldn't. Wa- I, I I I tried watching it by myself at night after the shows. Yeah, and once or twice, and then I regretted it. Like and, and bad. I, yep, and I stopped it, and I was just like, oh, okay, I gotta go to bed now because it's just spooking me. Yeah, and then just like, but can you just go to bed? Yeah, I just try to force myself, I, uh, but I can fall asleep so easily. I know, I can't do that. I would just be lying there thinking, well, as we know, with our poltergeist activity that happened, with well, my phone flying on the floor, that was so, you have to admit, that was so that, fucking weird. Yeah, that is and weird. I know that you were tired, and I know you didn't feel well, but once again, you gave me no I know, credit. because I don't want to, because, I, because I'm really good at just being like, nope, there's a good reason for that, now go to bed. Like, I just, I just tell myself in my head, like, yeah, but then you get to fall asleep. it was a dog, it was a dog. And then I don't want to hear, like, yeah, but the dog was there. I'm like, no, no, just tell me it was a dog. Okay, fine. And I just go to sleep. It's ignorant. Right, ignorance is bliss. But I'm stuck there not being ignorant, not sleeping. That sucks for you. <laughs> With no sympathy for my butthead husband. Well, I mean, if there is something, it's not like I'm going to be able to help. I mean, if it's a paranormal thing, what am I going to do? I'd see it with me, so I'm not the only one that sees it. No, thanks. <laughs> you you see it. Oh, God. I, I want to see it. I It is taking all of my strength to not just like have my mind go to how many tricks can I play on you while I'm out of town and you're in that house by yourself. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to start working on stuff right now. No. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. It comes back. It'll come back at you. No, because I'll be so mad at you. If you open the door, then I get to do it. You're big and tough and strong guy. You don't even believe in it. What do you care? I believe in it. <laughs> but I do believe in it enough because it scares me. If I didn't believe in it at all, it wouldn't scare me. Then look at it. But no, because I don't want to <laughs> see it. Because then I can't unsee it. That's what that's what that stuff is for me. If I see something that's definitely like a, oh, fuck, that is for right. sure a shadow person. Right. Oh, my God, that's some creepy entity walking towards me in the hall, and I'm definitely not asleep, and I'm seeing it with somebody else who, a corroborating witness, then I don't get to ever be the same again. Right, right. I don't want to see something that concrete. I want to think this this stuff is maybe real, but maybe not real, so I can play around with it. I can tell some stories, but also not be insane. I mean, I did have to tell the spirit to get out again this weekend. So you're probably okay. Okay, good. I like saged the whole house, did the whole thing, the candles. I told it it was time to go. You got to get out. But it was weird because the house felt clear for a while. And now... Not anymore? No, it feels better again. I probably bring him in. Maybe. Maybe. I don't. I don't know. Yeek. Well, thanks for ruining that story a little bit. <sighs> Sorry about. It. I should have held it till the end. It was. It was. Can killing you guys me. imagine anybody who listens to Time Suck? Can you imagine if I would have corrected Dan's pronunciation of something? You don't correct, but you do ask questions, which also That's part can of pu- our show. Which also can pull me out, though. But sometimes it's a little safer for the end. I can't remember. I think I have to write it down then. Okay. Can you start keeping like a sketch pad? <laughs> you got a little sketch pad? I might have to. I should have. I should have. I should have. We should both, yeah, save as much as possible for the end. Yeah, you could have You could have done it not in front of everybody. I know. I, I, reg- I regret it. I regret it. You regret it because you know I'm sensitive. True. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Somebody's in trouble later. Oh, geez. Uh, well, that is, do you have anything else? Uh, oh, I do. Okay. Oh, just, oh, I'll keep talking. I just I just have a few little things. We get so many presents, but yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for a couple of these. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lindsay's got some uh, socks on the table there and has a little handbag. Okay. Yeah, That's not a handbag. Well, I, was try- okay. I was just trying to kill time until you came back to the mic. <laughs> no. You you could just talk about yourself okay. or something. Uh, fuzzy socks. Uh-huh. I love these ones. They're so cute. Um, but I got this. Look, it's a crystal pouch. Oh, okay. I thought that that would make you crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Crystal, I, crystal designs seemed, on there. It seemed like a good place to keep crystals. No, that's not a crystal design. That's a constellation. Oh, okay. Hey, hey, hey. Um, but really, I don't remember who gave these to us. I think where were we that we got <laughs> that we got these? I thought this was so funny. We had that episode where we were oh, talking uh, about levitating Huntington Beach. Huntington Beach from John and Nicole Carney, uh, and it says for Lindsay, eventually he oh, will give fun. in like all men. And there's a giant. <laughs> amethyst in here and then for dan it says for dan levitation purposes only genuine san gabriel gravel and moss <laughs> and i just i thought this was such the way a, they're displayed is hilarious yeah i thought this was such yeah a that's awesome that's awesome gift and just really funny mm-hmm. so that's all that's so, all so thank you we get so many things we can't thank you for everything but um very lucky yeah yeah, yeah the presentation of those is hilarious 
I like things. <laughs> and thank you all for listening. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for um, you listening after last week. My voice show. I still, I felt dizzy the entire show today. Stupid medicine. I, I felt nauseous. Really? Yeah, I don't feel good at all. Did you have breakfast? Uh, not enough. Barely. But uh, I just, I'm just so annoyed at this point. Yeah. When it's been three weeks, I'm like, fuck. And I feel so bad for like people who have like long term. I'm like, oh my God. Well, think about like, okay. Be more empathetic towards people who are like constantly sick. Or people who have um, chronic pain issues. Right. That would suck. Yeah. Like my step, my stepdad had knee replacement surgery. Yeah. And then that like, it it was a whole long thing, but then he ended up like having back surgery. Yeah. And he had a heart attack a few days before his back surgery and didn't tell anybody because he's in so much physical pain. And he knew that if they knew they would cancel surgery, he was like, fuck it. I'm not telling anybody what happened. Yeah. Poor, that poor guy. Yeah. He's been in pain for a while. Years. Years. Uh, please keep uh, keep sending in your your tales of, of paranormal pain <laughs> to uh, my story at scared to death podcast dot com for yes, everything please. else. I- info at scared to death podcast dot com. That's correct. And then, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, you know, scared to death, a bad magic production. Uh, thanks to the bad magic productions team, Harmony Vela Camp on social media, Joe Paisley producing and directing, Zach Flannery part of the team as well, and Sophie Evans helping to find these stories now. And thanks to Joe Paisley, Zach Cohen, and Jeffrey Montoya for the sound beds, and Heather Rylander for taking over the My Story at ScaredToDeathPodcast.com emails. So subscribe on YouTube. Uh, you know, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Don't be a Darren. Don't be a Peggy. And be scared to death. Bye. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness. And remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death.